Dear colleagues, today we're meeting again to continue the second part of our very important topic, which is postpartum hemorrhage. End of this lecture, I'm going to just have our learning outcomes, which is defining and differentiating between early and late postpartum hemorrhage, identifying the causes and risk factors of postpartum hemorrhage, identifying symptoms and signs of postpartum hemorrhage, and listing the laboratory investigations, how to manage postpartum hemorrhage immediately after delivery of the baby and before delivery of the placenta, how to manage postpartum hemorrhage immediately after delivery of the placenta, and the management of postpartum hemorrhage 24 hours after delivery. So, by the end of the previous lecture, we stopped at what are the complications that may occur in cases of postpartum hemorrhage. We spoke about the causes, the clinical picture, the prophylactic measures, and how to rapidly uh, diagnose cases of postpartum hemorrhage and manage cases of minor or major cases of postpartum hemorrhage. Now we're going to speak about what are the drugs that we are going to give in order to aid the uterus to contract. Remember the causes of postpartum hemorrhage? The four T's, the tone, the trauma, the tissue, and the thrombotic factors. These are the four T's we spoke about. We're going to repeat it very much and very frequently in order for you to remember them always. First of all, we're going to give ecbolic drugs in order for, to remain the uterus contracted, to continue the tone that's present inside the uterus, to prevent the atony that may occur inside the uterus. First of all, we're going to give prostaglandins, prostaglandin E1 analog, which is misoprostol that may be given rectal or oral or, or sublingual or buccal, but it's not preferred to give it vaginal because of the bleeding condition of the patient. You could give up to five tablets of misoprostol, a prostaglandin E1, which is up to 1,000 micrograms. They may be given in order to maintain the contraction of the uterus. Well, actually, the gold standard in the management and the prevention and the management of postpartum hemorrhage is oxytocin. You should give intravenous infusion 20 international units in one liter IV fluids at the 60 drops per, per minute, then infuse at 40 drops per minute. You should not give more than three liters of intravenous fluids containing oxytocin because it may cause salt and water retention. It may, you should not give an IV bolus of more than 10 units. You could give an IV bolus of 10 units of uh, international units of uh, oxytocin, but it's not preferred to give a higher dose because it may cause uh, severe hypotension if you give a IV bolus of oxytocin. And you may give methyl ergometrine. Well, methyl ergometrine causes severe vasoconstriction of the blood vessels. And hence, it's contraindicated in cases of preeclampsia, hypertension, or heart disease. It should be given IEM or very slowly IV on a drip, but it's better to be given uh, IVM, IM in a form of 0.2 milligram, which could be repeated after uh, 15 minutes. But again, the methyl ergometrine, which is the method gene, could cause severe vasoconstriction in the blood vessels, and hence very, be very cautious with this drug in cardiac patients. So now you diagnose the case of postpartum hemorrhage. What's your active management? How are you going to manage this condition? Hemorrhage after delivery of the neonate and before delivery of the placenta? This is a condition. And hemorrhage after delivery of the placenta, this is another condition. So if there is a retained placenta inside. So if you remember the stages of labor, we have the first stage, which is from the onset of uterine contractions till the full cervical dilatation. The second stage of labor from the full cervical dilatation till delivery of the baby. And the third stage, which is delivery of the placenta. So if the placenta fails to deliver and there is profuse vaginal bleeding, this is postpartum hemorrhage. How you're going to manage this condition first of all you have to determine the cause of the retained placenta is the placenta retained and there is a morbid adherence if the placenta is retained and there's just simple adherence or if the placenta has separated from the uterus but is retained inside the uterus because the uterus is failing to contract and expel the placenta these are the three main sub classes that you should properly diagnose in order to properly manage the condition First of all, you have to administer methyl ergometrine or oxytocin or give misoprostol in order to enhance the uterine contraction, followed by the active management of the third stage we spoke about. You have to give oxytocin, you have to give, you have to do cord traction, and you have to do a fundal massage or a uterine massage in order to maintain the uterine contraction. So if the uterus is properly contracted, but the placenta does not separate, this excludes that the uterus is atonic and the placenta is separated inside the uterus. 
then you're going to try to just simply try to do cord traction in order to try separate a simply adherent placenta. And then if it's failed, you're going to try the second step we're going to speak about again. But if all of these failed, you may be diagnosed with the case of morbidly adherent placenta to the uterine tissues. And this will not end by a vaginal procedure. This you're going to have to do a laparotomy in order to deliver the placenta. We're going to speak about it in a couple of minutes. So if you have the placenta still inside, avoid forceful cord traction and under pressure. This may cause uterine inversion. You have to explore the perineum, the vagina, and the cervix looking for laceration because, as we said before, do not manage just one case and forget all the other cases of uh, postpartum hemorrhage. So the placenta may still remain inside the uterus, but this patient may be suffering from tears inside the vagina or in the cervix or even in the uterus or the case of a ruptured uterus and the placenta is present inside the abdominal cavity. So you have to make sure that there is no trauma present inside the genital tract. You have to call the anesthesiologist because most of the procedure is going to do later on. The anesthesiologist must be present and the patient must take proper anesthesia, whether proper sedation at the beginning or proper anesthesia in the form of a general anesthesia in order to manage the condition. Now we're going to speak about the manually removing the placenta, which is done under adequate sedation or proper anesthesia, the manual removal of the placenta. In this procedure, as we said, if there is a simple adherence of the placenta, you could deliver the placenta by this method. You have to, you should, the patient receive proper anesthesia. You should never, ever, ever introduce your hands inside the genital tract, specifically the uterus, without giving the patient proper anesthesia. So you should introduce one hand into the vagina along the umbilical cord. Later, then, you're going to just try to find a line of separation between the placenta of the uterus. You're going to support the uterus, the fundus, with the other hand and try to just move your hands between the line of separation between the placenta and the uterus while you're holding the cord in order for the placenta not to be uh, separated or cut inside. And the final step is you're going to hold the placenta completely and deliver it through the uterus. If there is a, an improper procedure done, you may leave part of placenta inside. Or if you improperly diagnose the condition, the placenta may be morbidly adherent and you find the placenta still present inside and it, this part will be usually present on top of a previous scar whether the cesarean section or a myomectomy. Unfortunately, if you do this procedure in a, a wrongful uh, method, you could perforate the uterus with your other hand. So you have to be very gentle and you have to know the anatomy you're speaking about. So as we said, the manual removal of the placenta, you're going to palpate inside the uterine cavity to ensure that all the placental tissue has been removed. You're going to give ecbolic drugs in order to maintain the uterine contraction. You have to massage the fundus of the uterus. After delivery of the placenta, you have to examine the uterine surface of the placenta to ensure that it's complete. Examine the woman carefully and repair any tears or episiotomy. Again, if there's a retained placenta, that does not mean that there is no trauma. That does not mean that there is no atony. You have to manage all the causes simultaneously. If the placenta does not separate from the uterine surface, suspect an adherent placenta and proceed to form a laparotomy. And possibly, if you could not separate the placenta, you may need to do a hysterectomy because of the profuse blue bleeding that is present. So, if hemorrhage occurs immediately after delivery of the placenta, what's going to be your management? First aid management, as we said, you're going to give ecbolics, and then you're going to transfer the patient to the OR. In the OR, you have to very be very precise in the management of this patient. As we said, every minute differs with the patient. So you have to explore the perineum, vagina, cervix, and uterus looking for lacerations and repair if needed. But this is not going to be done without anesthesia, proper anesthesia. So as we said before, you're going to call for help. You're going to transfer the patient to the OR. You're going to call for an anesthesiologist. And then you're going to start exploring the patient from down up. So you have to explore the uterine cavity for if you're any uterine placental fragments. If there is any retained placental fragments, remove them manually or with a ring forceps. If there is any tears present inside the perineum, the vagina, the cervix, or the uterus, it has to be properly managed. And it's very important to properly examine the cervix. We're going to speak about this in the face-to-face -face session, but you have to examine the cervix properly. If there is a tear in the cervix and you could not find the apex of this tear, this patient usually has a ruptured uterus. So if there is a tear present inside the cervix and you did not find the apex of it, you could not uh, suture the apex of this 
tear. This is usually an extended tear that may take the lower segment of the uterus. And unfortunately, these patients pass unnoticed. And then can, they come later on shocked because of an undiagnosed uterine rupture. If the hemorrhage still persists, assess the patient's clotting status using a bedside clotting test. Failure of a clot to form after seven minutes of a soft clot that breaks down easily suggests coagulopathy. If the bleeding continues in spite of the above management performed by manual compression of the uterus, which is a very, very important test. Now, you examine the patient, you examine the vulva, perineum, the vaginal, the cervix. You made sure that the uterus is intact, there's no tears in the uterus. You made sure that there is no remnants present inside the uterus. You made sure that the uterus is starting contraction, starting giving ecbolics. You start checking for coagulopathy. As I said, all the causes are being checked simultaneously. So if there is still bleeding present and the uterus is not properly contracted, you're going to do something called by manual compression. In this test, the main aim of it is to compress the uterus between both hands, a hand present inside the vagina and another hand present outside on top of the abdomen of the lady, in order to compress the uterus between both hands to decrease, causing kinking of the uterine artery to decrease the blood supply to the uterus and to enhance the uterine contractions by compressing the uterus on top of itself. So you're going to do the bimanual compression. It should be done for at least 10 minutes. And then you're going to assess the condition. After the bimanual compression, if you find the uterus contracted and the bleeding decreased markedly, you could continue the bimanual compression. If you find that the bleeding is still profuse or still excess in amount, you could pervert or you could start doing uh, various other procedures, for example, starting to do an emergency laparotomy in order to start taking other maneuvers to try to save the life of this patient. Do not waste valuable time trying to save the uterus at the expense of the general condition of the mother. And this is very crucial. Lots of ladies lose their lives because their doctors stated that they tried to save the uterus of the patient. And this is very important. We have a, a saying that a, a, a live mother without a uterus is a better, with, better than a dead mother with her uterus. This is the bimanual compression we, speak, we spoke about. Its main aim is to cause kinking of the uterine vessels in order to decrease the blood going to the uterus and also to enhance the uterine contraction. As I told you, it must be done for at least 10 minutes. It's a very, very powerful procedure and you should do it properly. For a person to do it properly, he cannot do it more than two to three minutes. So you must change with your colleagues in performing this procedure and then assess the condition after 10 minutes. Another method that could be used is uterine packing. If the bleeding is from the lower part of the uterus, which is the placental site or which is the lower segment or which is decidual hemorrhage, uh, packing the uterus may be effective in decreasing the amount of the blood loss. So using either a fully scatheter or a semi-staken blackmore tube that's been used in cases of esophageal pharesis and, and hematemesis are useful for cases of uterine atony, uh, retained placental tissue and placenta accrete. The retained placental tissue should be removed, but the site of the placental invasion may suffer from bleeding. Most of the fully catheter and the sun mistaken blackmore tube have open tips which permit continuous drainage from the uterus. So it's actually put inside the uterus, inflated with around from 100 milliliters if you're speaking, speaking about bleeding from the lower segment or up to 500 milliliters if it's uterine atony and you're trying to manage this uterine atony. And then it has an open tip which causes drainage of any blood present. This test, this method is also a form of a test. If it succeeds, then you know that the bimanual compression and the uterine tamponadic may help to save the patient a laparotomy or a hysterectomy. But if these methods fail, then this patient must resort to a laparotomy and the other measures that could be taken during the laparotomy. This is a picture of the ba balloon tamponade, which is called one of the other forms of tamponading, which is called a bacri tube. The bacri tube could be filled up to 1,000 milliliters. It's inserted inside the uterus, as you see, and it enhances and compresses the endometrial walls, starts compressing, compressing the bleeders, and at the same time causes the uterus to contract on top of it. You have to give ecbolics together with the balloon tamponade to make sure and ensure the continuous contraction of the uterus to prevent atony later on. The ultrasound can more effectively detect, detect a developing hematoma in the contrast 
uh, is a fluid filled balloon as opposed to the blood saturated gas. So if you put a fluid filled balloon, this is much better than a gauze that could compress the endometrium because an ultrasound could detect the hematoma much easily. Thus, this technique has the advantage of being not only therapeutic but also direct diagnostic when used in combination with ultrasound in differentiating the various etiologies described above. Using a 24 French Foley's catheter, guide the tip into the uterine cavity and inflate with 20, 30, or up to 100 milliliters of saline or sangustaken black mold tube, which has a larger capacity, which can reach up to 500 or 1,000 milliliters of fluid that could compress the endometrium and that could enhance the uterine contractions on top of it. If the bleeding stops, the patient can be observed with the catheters in place, and then they could be removed 12 or 24 hours later on. So, if the balloon tamponading fail, what's our next step? As we said, you must act promptly. You must work with your team and you must take your decisions very rapidly. You have to do a laparotomy. During the laparotomy, you have various measures to perform. First of all, you have to inspect the uterus. If there is any trauma present in the uterus or if there is any rupture uterus present, you're going to find the rupture uterus either in the lower segment and extension of a cervical tear, as we said before. So if you find a cervical tear you could not reach, you have to stitch, do not stitch the cervical tear unless you see the apex of the tear, because this tear may be extending inside the lower segment and causing a rupture uterus. So during the laparotomy, you have to inspect the uterus properly to make sure that there is no rupture present neither in the lower segment or in the previous scar or in the upper segment of the uterus. You have to repair the ruptured uterus adequately or you have to perform a hysterectomy if you find that the rupture or that the trauma is not repaired, unrepairable or that it's going to take much more time and the condition of the patient does not withstand this condition. If the uterus is atonic, you have to perform a direct uterine massage and then you're going to start taking the stitches we're going to speak about. This is one of the very important stitches that has been adopted in the years 1997 and 1998 by, by an, a surgeon who is an English surgeon is called Mr. Christopher B. Lynch. Mr. Christopher B. Lynch started taking a specific stitch, we're going to speak about it now, that helped the uterus to contract on top of itself to decrease the blood supply to the uterus and hence try to manage cases of atonic postpartum hemorrhage. You may Put a balloon tamponade vaginally if the surgical stitches were successful. Ligation of the uterine and uterine ovarian arteries, and this is called stepwise devascularization of the uterus. To devascularize the uterus, this may decrease the blood going to the uterus, and this may aid in decreasing the amount of postpartum hemorrhage. You start by uterine artery ligation, and then followed by ovarian artery ligation, and may be ending up by internal iliac artery ligation, which is the hypogastric uh, artery ligation. If all of these methods failed, we're, we're speaking about you inspected the uterus in just 30 seconds, you're starting doing uterine massage in another 10 or 15 seconds, you're starting taking your surgical stitches, the B-Lynch stitches, it does not take more than two minutes, you're going to do se selective devascularization another three or five minutes, and this is all 10 minutes. If after 10 minutes, the patient is not responding properly and the bleeding is severe in spite of all these previous measures, you have to do a hysterectomy. As we said in the previous slide, do not waste valuable time trying to save of the uterus and losing the patient later on. So what are the surgical compression sutures, which are the B-Lynch sutures? It's a mechanical compression of the uterine vascular sinus, preventing further engorgement with blood and continued hemorrhage. It's used to treat atony and hemorrhage that does not respond to pharmacological interventions, as we said before. It's used if the bimanual compression decreases mildly the amount of uterine bleed. So if the uterine compressions markedly decrease the vaginal bleeding, you're going to not do a laparotomy. But if the bimanual compression decreased partially the bleeding, but there is still bleeding that you started or decided to do a laparotomy, you're going to do the B. Lynch suture. But if the bimanual compression did not decrease the bleeding at all, and you find that there is still severe profuse bleeding coming from the patient, it's unwise to waste time doing the B. Lynch stitch, and it's better to uh, either do the systemic devascularization of the uterus or go to hysterectomy immediately. This is the stitch you're, you're going to go through the uterine incision from the lower part of the uterine incision and then you're going to go to the back of the uterus take a stitch in the back of the uterus and then come back again through the upper part of the uterus and then go through the upper part of the uterine incision and come through the lower part of the uterine incision like a strap-on on top of the uterus this is from 
back of the uterus, you see the stitch taken transversely through the back of the uterus, and then you go the other limb again on the top of the uterus to go through the uterine incision from the front. Finally, you start closing the uterine incision and then you tie the stitch properly. It was previously said that you do the stitch with chromic cut gut stitches, but uh, unfortunately, because of the mad cow disease, the chromic cut gut is not available now. So now we do it with vicryl or monocryl, which is, uh, these are types of the stitches used in doing the bill inch stitch. And this is the final picture. You're going to find the uterus contracted on top of itself. The stitch is taken inside the uterine cavity, cause uh, a form of compression of the bleeding sinuses and decrease the blood loss later on. This is a diagram on how to do the stitches. You go number one from the lower uterine incision, come from the upper uterine incision, go to the back, take a stitch in the back of the uterus, and then come back again on the anterior part of the uterus where you tie your stitch and then you close the suture line again. This is another picture of the B-Lynch stitch taken from anterior, posterior, and after you finally finish the B-Lynch stitch. So, we said that the B-Lynch stitch is the uh, one of the measures taken if you find that the bimanual compression is successful in decreasing the blood loss. So the second step, we said systemic devascularization, where you ligate the uterine artery first, then you ligate the uterovarian vessels, and then if all of these are not successful, you could ligate the hypogastric or the anterior division of the internal iliac artery in order to try to decrease the blood loss and the blood supply to the uterus. If all of these measures fail, you're going to have to reside to the hysterectomy. And we're not wasting too much time, as I said. In, in the maximum, you're going to take 10 minutes before you decide you're going to do a hysterectomy or not. And this decision is very, very important to be taken promptly. So this is primary postpartum hemorrhage. There is still another point about primary postpartum hemorrhage we're going to speak about in the face-to-face -face session. What is after the surgery. How are you going to treat this patient later on? What about secondary postpartum hemorrhage? Secondary postpartum hemorrhage, we said, that is occurring after 24 hours of labor. So a patient who delivered 24 hours ago and everything was fine, if she suffers bleeding later after 24 hours up till the end of the perperium, which is six weeks or 42 days, this is called secondary postpartum hemorrhage. What are the causes of secondary postpartum hemorrhage? The causes of secondary postpartum hemorrhage are numerous and include endometritis, and this is the most severe and the most aggressive forms of bleeding that may occur. If severe infection occurs, that may lead to affection of the endometrium and causing erosion of the blood vessels. It's going to be suffering from severe blood loss, and unfortunately, this blood could end up to a hysterectomy done for this patient. Retained products of conception, this may be another cause. Subinvolution of the placental implantation site or remnants that may be present inside the subinvoluted uterus and gestational trophoplastic diseases that may be present inside the uterus following the process of delivery. The management of women presenting with secondary postpartum hemorrhage should be very, very, very precise, including an assessment of their hemodynamic status an assessment of the blood loss and an evaluation of the woman's concern. For example, is her bleeding becoming convenient because it has persisted longer than she had expected? Or actually there is an active bleeding because of one of the causes we spoke about previously. So if the patient is presented with secondary postpartum hemorrhage, how are you going to manage this condition? First of all, you have first aid management. You have to administer IV broad spectrum antibiotics because as we said, the main cause of the bleeding may be endomyometritis. Also, there is a retained products of conception and you're going to remove it. You have to give broad spectrum antibiotics. So giving IV broad spectrum antibiotics is very important in the management of cases of secondary postpartum hemorrhage. Actually, the IV broad spectrum antibiotics may be the only line of manage. If this patient is suffering of endomyometritis and she responds properly to antibiotics, you could not do, uh, we should not do any other procedure to manage the condition. If there is any uh, form of uh, atony, which is a bit difficult after 24 hours, but you should also give ebolic drugs. If the cervix is dilated, you should explore to remove large clots and placental fragments with, plus manual exploration of the uterus, which is done under general anesthesia or regional anesthesia. You should not explore the uterus manually without anesthesia. If the cervix is not dilated properly, you should evacuate the uterus to remove any placental fragments after dilatation of the uterus. In rare cases of bleeding continues, you should consider performing a systemic devascularization of the uterus also. So if you have suffered from bleeding 
and the patient uh, does not respond to antibiotics, and the patient still has excessive amount of vaginal bleeding, you may reside to a laparotomy. You're going to do a systemic devascularization. There is no rule for B-Lynch over here because the uterus has uh, involuted usually, so the B-Lynch stitch is not used in cases of secondary postpartum hemorrhage. So you're going to do systemic devascularization by ligation of the uterine, the ovarian, and the internal iliac artery or the hypogastric artery. If these succeed in decreasing the amount of blood loss during the operation, during the procedure, you're not going to reside to a hysterectomy. But if these measures fail to control the amount of blood loss, you're going to do a hysterectomy for the patient, as we said previously, that cases of infection may end up with hysterectomy. So you're going to check the cervix, as we said. If it's open, perform a keratage and perform osteological investigations of the products of the keratin. If the cervix is closed, give broad spectrum antibiotics for one week and reassess the condition of the patient. Uh, performing a histological investigation is very important, together with doing a beta HCG tit. A HCG tit prior to your procedures may help you diagnose cases of gestational trophoplastic tumors that may be present following the process of labor, and this has a totally different line of management, including methotrexate and other measures of chemotherapy. Monitoring during the hospital stay is very important. You have to check the patient's blood pressure and pulse every 30 minutes for the first two hours, then hourly for six hours, and then every four hours. You have to perform gentle uterine massage. You have to check for the vaginal bleeding every hour, and you have to check for the urine output every two hours. This is the immediate line of management during the hospital stay of the patient. This patient that whether received a massive amount of blood transfusion, that had performed a laparotomy, that had done a hysterectomy, she's suffering from a very huge psychological trauma. So you have to assess the patient and you have to manage this patient psychologically before discharge from the hospital. This is a very important uh, item that may lead to a major postpartum depression, especially if the patient uh, during the procedure lost her baby. So you have to put this point in mind and you have to start uh, assessing the psychological condition of the patient later on before discharge. If you perform the hysterectomy, you have to tell the patient and you have to uh, tell her how to follow up uh, her condition. If any complications occur during the procedure, you have to tell the patient about it and you have to tell her how to manage this complication. We're going to speak about the complication in details in the face-to-face -face presentation. So you remember that a postpartum patient can lose a large amount of blood in a very short time. You must act promptly and anticipate complications. You have to assure adequate team coverage. A laparotomy for postpartum hemorrhage is an extremely urgent situation and need not to be delayed while waiting for a blood transfusion. You have to administer prophylactic antibiotics before and after the procedure. Do not give oxytocin as an undiluted IV push since the patient may collapse because of hypotension. This is a very important table. It speaks about the packed RBCs, the platelets, the fresh frozen plasma, and the cryo. These are the factors we may use uh, in the management of cases of bleeding, uh, the volume of each one of them, and what's its effect. We find the packed RBCs, the volume is 240 milliliters, and increase hematocrit by 3% per unit, and the hemoglobin by 1 gram per deciliter. The platelets uh, increase the platelet counts by 5,000 to 10,000 per cubic millimeter per unit. The fibrinogen, fibrinogen increases 10 milligram per deciliter and uh, the, in the fresh frozen plasma, and the cryoprecipitate increases the fibrinogen by 10 milligram per deciliter. You have to put these in mind when you start transfusion for the patient in order to properly replace the patient. Thank you very much for your time and hope to see you in the face-to-face -face session, inshallah. Thank you very much.